on Business Incorporated today. South Africa approves the release of over 1 billion rand for small businesses affected by the 2021 July unrest. And the African Development Bank ranks first on Global Aid Transparency Index. International Finance Corporation and Orange Bank Africa partner to support digital finance services in West Africa. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ibanga. Now let's take a look at the market. Starting in Africa, the NGX Dow almost half a percent, continuing the bearish trend in the week, while the JSE index in South Africa is down even more at intraday by 0.84 percent. In North Africa, the EGX 30 is still closed, same as in Kenya. Now to the Middle East. Now is mixed sentiment across the markets. We track in the UAE, the Abu Dhabi index is up to 1%, uh, close to 1%. The Dubai index is also up by 1.32%. Elsewhere, the Saudi Arabia and Qatari indexes both down 1.64% and 0.13% each. Now to Europe. The euro remains at near parity with the U.S. dollar and has even flirted with sleeping below dollar value. New inflation data, data out of the U.S. suggests this dynamic is more par-level par euro and dollar. It might not change anytime soon. Stephen Beersley is in Berlin to shed more light on this. Stephen, what can we say about the euro-dollar exchange rate right now? Well, since falling to parity with the U.S. dollar two days ago, the euro has pretty much hovered around that rate ever since. It has actually dipped below do the dollar at one point before coming back up. Now, the reason for this parity is because of the difference right now between the U.S. and European economies and the outlooks for both economies. Uh, the outlook in Europe is far worse than it is in the U.S., uh, for one, because of the war, but also because of the energy inflation that's a consequence of that war. Now, inflation in the U.S. is also quite high. We saw that again yesterday with a new inflation report that showed a new 40-year high. But the underlying fundamentals appear to be stronger when we look at uh, the labor market, when we look at the potential for growth. Add to that the fact that the central bank in the U.S. has been uh, far faster to raise interest rates and is expected to raise interest rates higher and faster in the coming months than the ECB, the European Central Bank. That tends to attract more investment when yields are higher, and so that tends to strengthen a currency as well. So we can expect uh, that trend to continue in the near future. And so what does a weaker euro, euro mean for Europe as a whole? Well, one thing is it, it, it makes imports denominated in dollars more expensive. And first and foremost, among those are energy imports. If they're more expensive, then potentially inflation can rise because of that. Uh, that also means, conversely, that demand might actually fall. Uh, it's also difficult for businesses that have grown accustomed to a certain exchange rate and are now having to change some of their plans. So some we might see business confidence fall as well if they also don't know where the exchange rate is going to go in the near future. On the bright side, it can make, or it does make, exports cheaper. Uh, exports leaving, of course, uh, goods leaving uh, Europe and heading outwards. Uh, and that is actually a bright spot, considering that exports have been uh, difficult in recent months, given higher inputs um, due to supply chain problems. So in theory, that would be something that can help the European Union and European Union manufacturers. Although, given the fact that there is a recession or a feared recession on the horizon, um, then even the consumer confidence uh, might be affected and uh, purchases might go down there. Mm, that's at least the uh, upside to that uh, weaker euro story. But what can we expect from European markets today? Well, that inflation report out of the U.S. is really driving markets today. Uh, in Asia, markets were mostly mixed because of that report. In Europe, they started out down. Um, there's also some fears here about the fate of the Italian government due to a no-confidence vote, so that's further weighing on sentiment. Investors otherwise will be watching the latest with the gas emergency in Europe. Um, some back and forth now between Gazprom, the Russian state gas firm, and European uh, countries about the fate of the Nord Stream 1 gas pipeline. That was the pipeline that on Monday was uh, operation was suspended for annual maintenance. And Europe fe fears that uh, the, the pipeline will stay turned off and then essentially gas pipe gas imports into uh, Europe will end there. So uh, that continues to shape a lot of the sentiment here, uh, and we'll keep our eyes on further developments with that as well as business consumer uh, metrics. 
Thanksgiving, we'll also keep our eyes open for the developments in that sector as well. Thank you for coming up, Stephen. Now we cross over to London, where Juliana is still standing by to give us updates on the happenings there. Hi, Juliana. Hi, Will. Now, Juliana, so the UK oil and gas lobby group has expressed disappointment as the windfall tax was passed into law yesterday. It looks like less profit now for the energy companies. Yeah, less profit uh, for the energy um, companies, but still lots of profit. If you look back uh, to the first quarter of the year, both Shell and BP, um, they posted, and it's their words, not mine, extraordinary uh, profits. And that's because since uh, lockdowns were lifted throughout the majority of the world and since uh, Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, oil demand is on the rise. So this is a time when they are... Uh, raking it in uh, with the profits and there was immense scrutiny lots of uh, criticism from all sides of the benches in the palace of westminster and in may uh, much to his dismay uh, the former chancellor rishi shunak did decide to impose what the conservative party called the energy profits levy they didn't want to call it a windfall tax so it's not called a windfall tax. I suppose they didn't want to do that because it would be literally copying and pasting a Labour opposition a policy. Um, it went through um, the, the, the MPs uh, for a vote on Monday, I believe, and yesterday it was given the final signature uh, from the House of Lords. So it is going to come into fruition. So up until 2025, any um, uh, oil producer that is in uh, the British North Sea who produces oil or gas they will be charged 25% on top of um, their profits. And this is going to last for a couple of years. And this is going to fund people who need it the most in this country. I was speaking uh, this morning on Business Morning about uh, the first instalment of the cost of living uh, payment, £326. It's schemes such as this that this profit um, goes to. Some would say it's only right considering they're profiteering at a time when people are struggling so much. And this is going to um, help, you know, the, you know, ease the cost of living for people in the UK at the moment. So this tax, this energy levy is probably much needed at this moment. So we're just moving with the whole Heathrow fiasco. We're just going to go straight to the airport and see what Heathrow is doing there because they cancelled, they asked airlines to cancel flights and Emirates today has refused to give in to that demand. What's their argument? Yeah, pretty interesting. Well, Emirates just say it's just unacceptable. They said it's unacceptable and they are going to refuse to comply. This is back to, as you were saying, this fiasco uh, that's currently taking place at Heathrow Airport. To be honest, it's actually taking place across most airports in the United Kingdom. But Heathrow being the largest, it's hitting them um, really hard. On Monday, uh, they asked um, airlines that operate out of their terminals, I believe particularly Terminal 5 and Terminal 3, uh, to cancel about 10% of their schedule. And now Emirates, have said that they're just not going to do that. They are asking uh, their passengers um, to, to turn up to the airport as usual. And of course, this is causing huge issues uh, with Heathrow. Uh, this is all about staffing levels. We know uh, that during the pandemic, uh, tens of thousands of people that were working in the aviation sector were let go, many of whom found better careers and they don't want to go back. And um, I don't think uh, airports in this country were expecting the demand and the rebound of travel. People are desperate to try and get out of this country at the moment. And they just can't uh, look after them. I think th this issue this week is down to ground handling staff. So I'm sure lots of people may have seen on social media um, uh, uh, miles upon miles of piles of bags. Uh, lots of people are not getting their bags because they don't have ground handlings. So they have asked um, airlines to comply. And Emirates have been one that have vocally said, turn up as usual. We are not going to comply with this. I do think this is going to cause uh, lots of issues. I know that there are about six flights uh, from Heathrow Airport um, that fly between London and Dubai. So I would urge, uh, uh, you know, anybody watching to check before they travel because they don't want to delay. But don't check on Twitter because the last time I checked, Twitter is down at the moment. Breaking news, Will. <laughs> you're, you're seriously 100,000 flights daily. I, I don't know with the much people we have in this world. I don't know how that's going to work, especially Heathrow is one of the largest airports in the world. Now, how are markets looking at the intraday? Not great. Um, of course, we are having our own domestic um, issues here. In fact, any moment now, we're going to 
uh, be finding out uh, who is ever closer to becoming a new tenant of number 10 Downing Street. Investors, of course, are looking at that. But there are inflation uh, woes and worries. We got uh, pretty uh, shocking inflation data yesterday, didn't we, out of the US, 9.1% in match with here in the UK. So they all share an intraday is down 0.84%, the FTSE 100 down to by 0.85%, and the FTSE 250, the domestic market, is down by 0.35%. Uh, the British pound has lost some of its ground on the US dollar. It's down by 0.36% down to uh, against the euro by 0.12%, but up against the Japanese yen at intraday by 0.61%. Well, thank you, Juliana. It's always good to catch up with you. You too. Thank now, you. in Hong Kong, stocks slipped briefly for more than 1%, uh, while Asia-Pacific markets traded higher on Thursday. The moves came as Singapore tightened monetary policy and Australia announced that its unemployment rate has fallen. The Hang Seng Index was 0.3% lower in the late afternoon. Mainland China markets were mixed. The Shenzhen component reversed earlier losses to rise 0.75% to 12,602.78 points and the Shanghai composite was down marginally. In South Korea, the Kospi slipped 0.27% to 2,322.32 points. Now the Nikkei 225 in Japan paired losses and rose 0.62% to close at 26,643.39 points, while the topics index was 0.23% higher. Australia's S&P ASX 200 was 0.44% higher. Now, official data showed that Australia added eight 88,400 jobs in June, much more than the 30,000 predicted by analysts. Now, stock futures were low in early trade on Thursday as traders look ahead to earnings from major U.S. banks. Dow Jones Industrial Average futures shed 1.39 percent. S&P 500 futures were 1.37 percent lower, and Nasdaq 100 futures were down 1.02 percent. Stocks slipped during Wednesday's session after June inflation data came in hotter than expected, hitting its highest level since 1981, and stoking fears that the Federal Reserve will have to hike interest rates more aggressively in the coming months to bring down price increases. The consumer price index rose 9.1 percent in June, higher than economics expectation of an 8.8 percent year-on-year increase. Core CPI, which excludes volatile prices of food and energy, was 5.9 percent, also ahead of the 5.7 percent estimate. Now, oil prices ticked down in early trade on Thursday as investors doubled down on the possibility of a rate hike by the U.S. Federal Reserve that would stem inflation and curb oil demand. Brent crude futures for September fell 0.2 percent to $99.37 a barrel after gaining $0.08 cents on Wednesday. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude for August delivery was at $95.93 a barrel, down 0.4 percent after rising $0.46 cents in the previous session. Worries of COVID-19 curbs in multiple Chinese cities to rein in new cases of a highly infectious subvariant has also kept a lid on prices. China's daily crude oil imports in June sank to their lowest since July 2018 as refiners anticipate COVID-19 lockdown measures to curb demand, according to the data showed on Wednesday. Now, gold prices slipped early on Thursday as Treasury yields and the dollar rose with bullion's outlook hurt by fears the Federal Reserve could go for a more aggressive interest rate hike this month after data showed U.S. inflation skyrocketed in June. Spot gold fell 0.4% to $1,728.39 per ounce, while U.S. gold futures dropped 0.5%. U.S. annual consumer prices jumped 9.1 percent in June, the sharpest spike in more than four decades, leaving Americans to dig deeper to pay for gasoline, food, health care and rents. Spot silver fell 0.4 percent to $19.11 per ounce. Platinum slipped 0.8 percent to $847.75 and palladium eased 0.5 percent to $1,964.74. Next. Updates from the commodities space right after the break.
Welcome back. According to latest reports by Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU, the global production of maize has been stagnant in recent years despite sustained improvement in agronomic practices and developments in seed technology. However, EIU projects that global production will increase by 7.7% year-on-year in 2021 and 2022 to 1,205.4 million tons and decline by 2% year-on-year to 1,181.7 in 2022 and 2023. If I OTC Analyst Financial Derivatives Company joins me to discuss how this report impacts African economies. Hi, Ifai, good to have you. Hello, good afternoon. Now, what is the impact of this development on maize import dependent countries like Nigeria and how can they edge against this? Okay, so in 2021, we saw that local production of maize in Nigeria increased by 16% um, year on year to 11.6 million tons. And we've also seen that, however, despite that fact, we still have um, um, low demand com compared to the supply that we have to meet our local demand. Now, for import dependent countries like Nigeria, we would see that we will have to import um, at higher prices or import lower volumes. This is based on the EIU reports that you just read out. Now, taking all of that into consideration, what we could have typically done is um, boost domestic production so that we would have enough capacity to meet our local demand. Now, let's not forget the unique factors that plague Nigeria, such as insecurity, transportation problems, um, lack of infrastructure, lack of proper storage facilities, to mention but a few. Now, some of these things um, have impeded Nigeria to be able to um, meet our local demand. What we it, it, already, it's too late. We couldn't predict issues such as the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, um, it's already happened and it's had a ripple effect across global economies. So what we can now do is leverage on the products that we have comparative advantage over whilst we look to our trading partners um, to mitigate um, that shortfall. Now, what we can do in the future is enter into forward contracts today so that in the future we can have um, our prices um, locked in um, at good prices so that we'll be able to meet um, our, our, our de demand gap. Now, maize is a vital raw material. It's, it's as very diverse uses. It's used in the production of ethanol and animal feed. The global demand for industrial ethanol has spiked from 13.12 billion gallons to 26.1 billion gallons in the past decade. And that's an increase of 121%. Now, it will be interesting to know in what ways this, can, this surge in demand for ethanol, the impact it can have on the dynamics in the maize market in Nigeria. So like you said, maize is a good source of um, ethanol. So ethanol is gotten from maize through the fermentation process. Um, not just maize, but we have products like cassava, potatoes, um, um, and I think um, sugarcane as well. So these are products that we can, from which you can get ethanol. So in Nigeria now, what we see is um, industries and companies partnering with state governments and the federal government through the NMPC to set up production plants. So ethanol production plants in certain states such as Adamawa, Jigawa states, Kebi states, um, and I think Kaduna states. So they're focusing on sugarcane based and cassava based ethanol production. We haven't really seen um, too much activity as it concerns maize-based ethanol production. And some um, experts have said that we would want to first focus on um, using maize to meet other more important demands. And I use more important in air quotes. So experts say that Nigeria, we have, um, or we use 60% of our maize to make animal feed. We use 25% um, in the food um, industry. And then the remaining proportion is consumed um, by households. So people have said, you know, we use cassava and sugarcane based ethanol. Let's focus on that um, to meet our local demand whilst we preserve our maize to meet other um, demand that, you know, traditional demand that we have. Now, what we will now see is if ethanol production increases, um, um, we will be able to meet local demand and then export the excess for foreign exchange. So in 2021, let's just see what the government is doing. The federal government uh, 
approved, you know, the cultivation of a genetically modified maize variant called Tella maize. And this is expected to be drought tolerant and disease resistant. Uh, how will the commercialization of Tella maize revolutionize the agricultural sector in Nigeria? And are there ethical concerns around the consumption of genetically modified products? Yeah. So it's very interesting, the whole um, genetic um, engineering as it pertains to food production. So it's, it's, it's a welcome innovation. And like you rightly said, the federal government announced the cultivation of um, Tela maize. And a few weeks ago, we've so, we also heard that it's been announced that they've, they would start trials um, in certain farms in different parts of Nigeria. So the trials basically would last for two planting seasons, one in 2022 and the second one in 2023. And the idea is to see how um, plants perform in comparison with you know, your regular maize um, seedlings. And um, if there's a boost in production, then we cannot distribute to other farmers. So we'll see how the trial test trials run first before we commercialize. Now, um, it's 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 a welcome innovation, like I said. So it would boost crop yield, which would help us produce more. Um, we'll meet our local demand, exports in exchange for foreign exchange. Um, there's lower risk of you know um, disease infested crops because we will need pesticides as well. Um, they'll be able to withstand harsh weather conditions because, like we know, maize traditionally grows during the rainy season. So if it's drought resistant, then we will need to um, irrigate the land during non-rainy season. So that's a welcome development. Now, to your questions about ethical concerns, um, bear in mind that if something is genetically modified, then the genes or the DNA of the product, be it a plant or an animal, is altered. So the concerns by stakeholders are mostly health-based, because if you ask your average Nigerian or, you know, they'll basically say we don't want anything that is not natural in our bodies. So um, that laying that foundation, some of their concerns include um, introduction of carcinogenic substances um, into the body, by, um, and carcinogenic substances cause cancer, like we know. And there's also um, allergic reactions, which we may not mm. be aware of, bearing in mind that um, gen genetically modified foods are a relatively new concept. Interesting, so, interesting um, concept. Uh, if I would look forward to see how this telemaze, you know, disrupts, you know, the maize uh, industry or the maize production in Nigeria. If I OTC analyst, financial derivatives company, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us in the program. <laughs> Now, South Africa's National Empowerment Fund, as the NEF, has approved the release of over 1 billion rand in funds for small businesses affected by the 2021 July unrest, supporting 211 firms and saving 9,452 jobs in the process. The majority of the funds distributed by the NEF went to businesses in the retail, real estate services, activities, uh, particularly those in food and beverages, transportation and storage and manufacturing sectors. The unrest which gripped the nation last July brought chaos to parts of KwaZulu-Natal and Guateng, damaging 200 malls and leaving about 3,000 stores looted, costing retailers 1.5 billion rand in stock. Still in South Africa, the South African economy slowed in growth for the month of June 2022, following a strong reading in May, according to the Bank Selva Africa Economic Transactions Index. As Betty, the actual index level moderated to 137.7 points in June, compared to the all-time high of 143 points in May. The Betty for June moderated to 5.3 percent, higher than a year ago, which was down significantly from the 9.4 percent in May 2022. And this could be an early sign of further and impending strain on the economy. The moderation of the Betty is not unexpected in light of the many headwinds that have surfaced in the local economy over recent weeks from recurring load shedding to the significant rise in fuel, food and general inflation increases. Publish what you fund 
The global campaign for the aid and development transparency has named the African Development Bank, AFDB, the most transparent organization in the world. According to the Transparency Index, the bank's sovereign portfolio now ranks first out of 50 global development institutions with a top score of 98.5. The AFDB president, Dr. Akimumi Adishino, says he's elated at the outstanding recognition, adding that it is a testament to the re relentless efforts of the more than 2,000 personnel across the organization who work tirelessly to accelerate Africa's progress. The African Development Bank achieved the highest score in the Aid Transparency Index's 10-year history and moved into the top spot from its fourth place ranking in 2020. The index is the only independent measure of aid transparency among the world's major development agencies and the bank has remained consistently in the very good category since 2014. Meanwhile, the African Development Bank has approved a 50 million euro unfunded risk sharing facility partnership with the Societe Generale to further support trade finance activities across Africa. The facility will contribute to reducing Africa's trade finance gap by enhancing Societe, Societe Generale's uh, risk bearing capacity by up to 50%. Beneficiaries of this facility will be issuing banks in Africa who will benefit from additional support from international banks to grow their trade finance business as well as small and medium enterprises and domestic firms who rely on these issuing banks to fulfill their trade finance commitments. The International Finance Corporation has announced a partnership with Orange Bank Africa OBA to support the growth of digital finance services in West Africa. Under the partnership, IFC will provide advisory services to Orange Bank Africa to help increase access to finance for agents and merchants operating in the mobile money ecosystem. The project pilot phase kicks off in kicks off in Cote d'Ivoire and will target 250 agents of the Orange Money Network to increase the access to financing through Orange Money and allow them to have sufficient liquidity to meet their clients' demands. And that's it on Business Incorporated. Thank you for watching. I'm Willie Bang. Bye for now.